Good afternoon and uh, welcome to another Hasselblad's Artist Talk series. Uh, I am uh, Steve Goldsmith and joining me today are uh, Nick Henry from Robert's Camera and our, uh, our guest uh, today is Roger Fishman. Welcome guys. Steve, thanks for having us. You guys can say hello. Yeah, thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for joining yeah. us, Roger. Thanks for uh, joining us, guys. So uh, you guys should have, uh, our attendees should have uh, seen the video so you know how to align your screen. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and uh, share my uh, my PowerPoint screen now so you may have to readjust your screen a little bit. Um, but without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with today. Again, thank you for joining Hasselblad and Roger Fishman uh, along, with Roger's, uh, along with Robert's camera today. So thanks for joining us. Today's agenda, it's a very uh, simple agenda. We'll uh, introduce you to Nick and uh, Robert's camera briefly. Uh, then we'll introduce you to Roger. We'll look at a little bit about what Roger carries around with him when he's uh, off on his adventures. Uh, and then we'll really get to the heart of the matter, which is the images uh, that Roger has created. And uh, we'll get into uh, um, what's behind those imagery. Um, so I'll turn it over to Nick now to introduce Robert's camera a little bit, and uh, we'll go from there. So go ahead, Nick. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Roger, thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, so my, my name is Nick Henry, and I'm on the professional and commercial sales team here at Robert's Camera, and we're here at the heart of Indianapolis, Indiana, um, and uh, Robert's is a family-owned and operated uh, photo specialty retail store. So uh, your major camera brands, lighting, accessories, anything you need for a, a professional uh, video studio, uh, on-location photography things, you know, we maintain um, the uh, H6D and the X1D series cameras for uh, uh, loaner as, as sales tools. Um, and uh, I'm very fortunate to work with uh, folks like Roger uh, and Steve, as well as the other um, folks on my team, um, just supporting um, you know uh, newspapers and studio photographers and uh, adventures like Roger uh, all over the country. Now let's be clear, let's be clear. Nick only likes supporting me when I'm not driving him crazy, which I do most of the time. So Nick's been outstanding, Steve's been outstanding, but I drive Nick crazy all the time. He's been unbelievably professional, unbelievably helpful, and honestly, without him, I, I couldn't do what I do. Thank so you, Nick, you guys have two stores, right? Uh, correct, yeah, so uh, I, I'm based out of the downtown location. Uh, we have another retail location uh, in Carmel, Indiana to serve the uh, customers on the north side of town and uh, folks who wanna drive from Northern Indiana. Uh, but we do all of our, our shipping and our use department, uh, which is online as usedphotopro.com, is based out of the downtown location. Very cool, very cool. So, uh, Roger, you and I met a number of years ago through Nick, and, and uh, um, you know, we've met, uh, uh, you know, uh, in person, and, uh, and uh, you know, Roger, you're an interesting guy. You've got uh, a lot of history, a lot of uh, drive, and a lot of passion. So, um um, I've got a couple of images here we'll share, but Roger, tell us a little about yourself and, and how you got to where you're at today and what drives you today. Well, looking at my background actually is, was more in corporate America. Uh, I had my own production and consulting company. I worked in the media and entertainment industry. Uh, and then when uh, our son was born, uh, right, actually right before he was born, I went to Africa for the first time and I realized that's where my heart was, which is exploring the world, connecting to nature and wildlife. Uh, so I migrated my business uh, and then I went into photography full time. And then about three plus years ago, uh, I fell in love with aerial photography. I loved uh, what I saw was going on around the world. And I wanted to hang out of a helicopter, as you can see in that picture uh, in Namibia. I wanted to have that experience of seeing, feeling, and uh, experiencing our planet in a completely different way. And so that's really my passion is to share the, the sublime beauty, the importance uh, of our environment to everyone, but to do it in a fine art, uh, art abstract and artistic fashion. I've heard you say this before and you publish it all over the place. And, and I think this really is uh, your heart's cry. Uh, what we just put on screen. No, I do believe, which is, you know, the risk in life is not taking one. So we all have our dreams. We all have our uh, 
hopes for the future. The important thing is to move forward to them uh, and to know that as you get closer to what is important to you and to your heart, uh, frankly, the more fulfilling it is. And that by not taking that step, you're asking yourself not to be your best self and not being true to yourself. So I'm a big believer in knowing your heart, being true to your heart, uh, and living as close as you can to that as possible. Uh, but before we go any further, I just want to say a couple of quick things for everyone that's listening. I, I do want to thank you, Steve, because you've been really supportive of my adventures. Uh, to the joke I was making about Nick, Nick's been phenomenal. I mean, I call him from all over the world whenever there's a question, a challenge, and he will stay up till four in the morning trying to figure it out. And I really, really appreciate that. Uh, I also know that while this is about photography and art and everything, I just want to take one second to say, uh, I want to thank all of the first responders, all of the essential workers that allow all of us to continue to live our lives in a healthy and safe way. And so uh, I really want to say how much I appreciate that. I also want to just say, I want to thank my family for uh, encouraging me, allowing me and supporting me to go you know, pursue my dreams. And also my colleagues, uh, Melissa Shoemaker, who without her, nothing gets done. Uh, my amazing pilot, Matthias from Iceland, uh, without him, uh, we don't get to Iceland. We don't fly over the Denmark Sea to Greenland. We don't circumnavigate three times. He's remarkable. Uh, and I have other amazing uh, people I, I work with around the world. So everybody, to me, it's about being a team, which enables me to be free uh, and to then go explore and share the world with everybody. So I just wanted to say that up front. Very cool. We're looking at this photo of you hanging out of a helicopter. And I know that you have an interesting story. So Nick, why don't you uh, see if you can pull that story out of Roger. Roger. Right, so how many points are on the harness you're wearing in that photo? Well, this photo is from uh, Namibia and I had a great pilot named Dirk and a guy named Jandra who is fantastic. Uh, I think the story you talk about was there was a time in Greenland where, you know, when we're flying, you know, I like to shoot straight down. And the reason I like to shoot straight down most of the time is it creates uh, an abstract perspective. You have no familiarity, no context for what you're seeing. So why do I do that? One is so the person who's seeing my uh, photograph is feeling first. They don't know what they're looking at. So their, their brain can't figure it out, but their heart, their feeling and emotion can respond. Then the next question is, what do they imagine it to be? So when you go from feeling to your imagination, you start to sort of swim in the photograph and start to make it your own. And then the third part is, uh, what does it mean to me? Because when someone's using their feelings and their emotions and their imaginations, they start to connect with art differently. So that's one of the reasons I shoot straight down and design my work in this sort of contemporary abstract way. The story you're talking about was when I was in Greenland, you know, we circle a lot and we bank a lot, very steep, so I can shoot straight down. And uh, one time as we were spinning and spinning, uh, I felt a tap on my shoulder and I just thought it was my harness. And then I felt a tap a little firmer and then I thought it was just my harness. And then I felt it really, really hard. And then all of a sudden I looked back and it was Matthias, my pilot. And I looked at him, I pulled myself back in and said, like, what's going on? He goes, your seatbelt, your harness, it's, it, it's not on, it's come off. And I was like, <laughs> when, when, when your harness and seatbelt come off and you're hanging out the helicopter, Oops. I, I, as I said, Matthias, don't tap on me, grab me and pull me back. <laughs> um, so we usually double check, triple check, but sometimes, you know, these harnesses and seatbelts are not meant for people who are twisting and turning and hanging out. They're meant for you to sit straight forward and just fly. Um, so we, we've had a few of those incidents and, um, but it's, it, as you can tell, it's all worked out and it's all worked out for the better. Yeah. So while we're talking about hanging out of uh, aircraft and stuff, uh, just a quick look at what you uh, typically take on your adventures. I know you're an H6D 100 shooter, and uh, um, and and it looks like this is what you have in your gear bag on a regular basis. Yes, and uh, I'm fortunate that I actually have two H6Ds, and I have two lenses. So when I'm flying, when I'm preparing for any of these adventures, I'm always looking at what am I trying to create, what's my my goal, but also you know what are the risks I want to mitigate. So I always like to have a, a backup uh, and I like to have the exact same backup. So when I, if I have to adjust, there's no learning, there's no time lost. 
Uh, so I always have the two Hasselblads, the two 35s to 90s, the two DJ Mavic Pros with Hasselblad lens on it. Uh, and I also took a GoPro uh, 360 camera with me. So my son could see what it looks like to have me hanging out of a helicopter from the skid looking up. Um, so anyway, cool. I always try to, I always have Very cool. a backup. Track. Well, sure. Very cool. Well, let's take a look now at, uh, at some of your imagery, Roger, of motion of you hanging out of your helicopter and capturing some video. So we're going to take a look at a, a quick video uh, from, uh, from Greenland. Uh, so we're going to switch our screen and we'll, uh, We'll take a peek at that. So this is uh, from Greenland. This is uh, a video. Roger, some uh, some awesome uh, footage there. Some uh, incredibly powerful imagery in that. Uh, I think while we we mainly are going to talk today about still photography, I think the uh, the uh, imagery and the video show the uh, the power of the water and and of the surrounding area. And we're going to get into that in this series of photos that we'll talk about uh, water as art from Iceland. Uh, so those of you out there watching, if you have questions for Roger as we go forward. Feel free to type them in to the uh, the question box, and we'll try and get as many of those answered as we can. Um, we have uh, we have one right now, and it's asking where those views from the drone were. Um, so, Roger, you can just explain where the video was from, and then we'll move on to uh, to the photographs. Sure, that that video in particular was all from Greenland. It was shot everywhere from the southwest to the uh, northwest to north central, and as also in the Greenland National Park, which is the largest national park in the world. So it really was covering all of, of Greenland because we, we actually circumnavigated it uh, on one of our trips. Very cool. Uh, and then Dennis also had a question. He asked if the Hasselblad's record video. And yes, Roger's camera can record 4K video, but I don't believe you use them as a video tool uh, for your projects. Uh, that's correct. I, I love the, the video component of it. It's just trying to maintain uh, a steady uh, video process while you're vibrating in a helicopter and banking. So my general rule of thumb is that when I'm flying, uh, it's the Hasselblad uh, H6D. And when I want to film, we land. Uh, if it's not safe for the helicopter to stay, he drops me off. He takes off someplace safe, which is seems kind of unfair, but he goes someplace safe. Um, and then I fly the drone around and then in the past, first two times, I would try to like wave to him from like a half a mile away, which is ridiculous. Uh, so now, now we have a good walkie talkie system for him to come back to me when I need him. Very cool. Well, we're taking a look at some of the imagery here from Iceland, Roger. It's a, star, it's a stark uh, image we're looking at it. To, what is it? Uh, well, First, I just want to give a little context to everyone who's tuning in and thank you everyone for, for joining, of course. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to listen. And again, any questions you have, by all means, let's let Steve know. I'll be glad to answer them. You know, I am completely uh, in love with water, all forms of water, you know, liquid, vapor, solid. So all of my work really is focused around capturing water at, really as an art form and also as a transformational power because water creates societies. It creates where we live, how we live. It creates the means for how things are shipped around the world. It's a fact that we're 65% water and that um, we're carrying our mother's 
uh, womb for 10 months and 99% water. I, water is the essence of all life. And water by itself is created through hydrogen and oxygen. So to me, it's constantly transforming and shaping from uh, hydrogen and oxygen to water, water to uh, snowflakes. Snowflakes create glaciers. Glaciers crack off and create icebergs. So water to me is, uh, to me is as pure as it can be as it's the, the source of all life. So as it relates to all my work, you're going to see water as a key component uh, in what we're discussing today. What we're discussing today in this photo specifically, we're in a, a glacial lagoon in Iceland. And what you're looking down on is a like a rock mountain that's coming out of this glacial lagoon. And it's just completely surrounded by water and this algae underneath that is really iridescent and had just that morning just gotten a little bit of snow had dropped onto the mountaintop which created that nice soft white pure palette in contrast to the sort of the darkness and abyss around it and i just thought that it was very sort of singularly focused it had different textures and layers uh, and also allowed the viewer to explore a lot of the different details of designs patterns and also create the question of what am i feeling when i see this what am i seeing and what does it make me um, imagine in my own heart? So all of my work has that balance of engaging people in that way, or the attempt to, I should say. Typically, Roger, when you go on one of your adventures, uh, uh, what is the time frame? How long are you there? How long are you in Iceland or Greenland? And, and, and before you go, what is the prep time? How much time does it take you before you actually embark in one of your journeys? Uh, you know, each place, uh, has its own sort of uh, requirements. Obviously, the first time you go somewhere, there's a lot more prep. Uh, when I go to Iceland, you know, it's probably a two-week prep uh, now. When I go to Greenland, it's always probably a six-month prep because there's a lot more considerations of logistics and safety uh, because when you're in Greenland, there is, no, there is no backup where we go. It's so remote that you have to make sure you're going to be self-contained and self-sustainable. So each place in Antarctica has a whole different component to it. So I'd say between two weeks to nowadays to probably three to six months uh, for each location. And we have a, we have a question from, um, uh, from Mark. He's asking, um, uh, do you have settings you use to avoid the camera from shaking? And I know that you use, I think you use a stabilizer. Is that correct? A gyro? Yeah, I, use a, I use a Kenyan gyro. And they're, they're obviously a leader in what they do, and they're fantastic. So I couple that uh, gyro with usually pretty fast shutter speed. And those are the two things I use to balance out to try to minimize the shake, because you do get a lot of vibration with the helicopter. So you get vibration, and then you get banking, okay? And then, you know, you're spinning, and you're looking, and you're twisting. So the gyro and the high shutter speed are the two things I work with the most. Very cool. What's this image we're looking at here, Roger? So this is from Iceland, and what you're seeing on the left part of the screen are these water patterns. So imagine, you know, the glaciers and the ice they'll, they'll melt, and as they come down, they go over rock and boulder and sand and dirt, and they're taking moraine with them and minerals with them, and they start to absorb and reflect different colors. So you see the motion on the left is water pattern which is really, I thought, quite otherworldly. And then you look in sort of the, say, the, the right part of it, which has the more of the color to it, that's also water that's coming from a different source and coming from a different direction. And then on the far right, you're seeing land, just a sliver of it. Because I just wanted to frame this image to give it a little bit more of a, a context to hold it all together. But what you're really looking at all this is the dynamics of water water as it moves minerals, as it moves moraine, as it picks up uh, different colors, and as it carves through uh, the land. And the same thing here. You know, the, the beauty of Iceland is just, it's ubiquitous, it's pervasive. Uh, and the more that you wander in, in Iceland or in Greenland and in the world, the more the Mother Earth reveals to her. So I'm constantly looking for new places to go, but realizing that Everything you're looking at is, is a moment in time because the water levels change second to second. So when you see something like this image, you have to capture it right away because if you try to come back, clouds may come in, the weather may change, it's gone. The water 
pressure may change, everything can change. So you're looking at these specific moments in mother's history. I know that a lot of the imagery we're looking at were captured over the last year or so. And one of the questions we have um, is how were you able to travel overseas given COVID related restrictions and, and the like? So I know that That's you and I have question. discussed that a little bit. Maybe you can share that with our audience. Well, okay. once again, you know, I have some amazing friends uh, around the world. And this past summer, I did have the privilege of going to Iceland during COVID. But to do so, I had to get a special waiver from the Icelandic government. And my, my dear, dear friend, Siggy, helped me with that. And then we had to get a special waiver from Greenland's government as well. And fortunately, my amazing pilot and his colleague uh, helped us get that waiver too. And part of it is because we also, and I work with a lot of different scientists. So while I'm doing everything from a creative aspect, when I go to these places, I've talked to anywhere between you know, eight to 12 different scientists about what can I do on my expeditions? Or what can I photograph? What can I film? What can I bring back that would be a benefit to, you, to them and to the scientific community? And so that also is part of the reasons that these governments uh, provided these special visa waivers this year. Very cool. We have another question. It's um, uh, it's from uh, Robert. He's asking, can you explain more about the process of how you take a natural looking shot and add the artistic elements of color, movement, et cetera? And also he wants to know if you have any uh, work on exhibition in uh, galleries in New York. Uh, gr a great question. Uh, and so let me try to answer the first question. You know, when, when we're flying, you know, we're literally just wandering looking for what possibilities might exist. And so I think of my job as you know, Mother Earth is the artist. She's created all this. I think of myself more sometimes as a designer or a composer. So I have to look for what is the best representation of what I'm feeling and how do I bring it to life in the most uh, creative way, most inspiring way that when you look at it, you're, you're completely taken into it. So it's really a constant uh, dance, literally, between me with my pilot, the helicopter, and Mother Earth, and the weather conditions. So we're literally always moving, swimming in, in the air to design what I believe will create a moment such as what you're looking at right now. Uh, to the second part of your question, right now, I, I do and then not- Dennis. I, was gonna say, I, don't, I do not have a show going on in New York right now. I was in one a year ago. Uh, and I hope to get back. It's, it's like any other place in this world. New York's a great city for art and for, for sharing. Roger, Dennis is asking for uh, an idea of scale. He's asking how large are these scenes typically? What, 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 you know, it's hard with uh, an abstract like this to get a sense of scale. You know, it's, it's a great question. You know, I tend to do my photography anywhere between 500 feet altitude up to 1,500 feet. That tends to be my range. There's some this past year in Greenland. To get the shot, we had to climb up to 8,600 feet. Uh, and it was at two in the morning. <laughs> and my wonderful pilot was like, can we please go home? Can we please go home? I'm like, no, higher, higher. Um, so the scale of some of these can be anywhere between uh, a couple of hundred meters by a couple hundred meters. Sometimes they can be you know, half a mile by half a mile. I mean, it really does vary. Uh, in this photograph you're looking at right now, this is a very uh, beautiful glacial lagoon in Iceland. And it's been shot a lot of different ways and I wanted to shoot it in a completely different way. So there's two lagoons, one on the left, one on the right. And so we literally circled it and then we banked as steep <laughs> as we could with me hanging out to get this perspective. This is probably, you know, I, I'd almost have to defer. You're talking about hundreds of meters uh, by hundreds and hundreds of meters, I would say in this image specifically. It's an amazing shot. It's just a, a, the, the, the color is just breathtaking. It, it's, it's just it's an amazing shot. Um, we've got a question. I'm going to combine two questions into, uh, into one here. One is asking, uh, by Dennis, if you get any science funding for your work. And the other one is um, uh, from Jim, who's asking if you're using grants for these expeditions. 
Uh, and then he also is asking you typically how long are you airborne for each sortie? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is uh, I, I self-fund, uh, which gives me all the freedom and flexibility to explore the way that I want to explore. And then I collaborate with scientists, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with what I am creating. So right now, uh, there's there's no funding coming from uh, the scientific community. But from my perspective, it's a, a personal responsibility uh, to share what I can so they can have access to both images, which are high extremely high resolution, which is better than what they get from satellite, as well as video, so they can study the planet. Uh, so that's how I approach it. Very cool. What a, uh, this is uh, this almost looks like, in my opinion, feathers on the right hand side. It's an amazing shot. That's the good news about each of these images. Have, Whatever uh, you feel it is. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What's the question? No, no. Go ahead, Roger. You finish your con your your comment. No, I was gonna say what I love about your your comment is that it looks like feathers. Is that's exactly what I I would hope that every individual uh, comes to this with is again, what do they feel? What is the what does it evoke inside of them? What's the emotional aspect? And then we'll let their brain and their imagination, their creativity run free. So for you, if it's feathers, fantastic, it's feathers. If someone else feels and sees something else, that's amazing too. And that's why uh, with all my abstract work, I don't give them names or titles. I just mention the colors of the photos. This way, I'm not encouraging someone to see something that I see. I'm just enabling them to see and feel what they see and feel. So we have a question from uh, from Richard. He's asking if you could discuss our your processing workflow. Um, and then along with that, Fernando's ask, also asking is what your post-production process is. Um, so maybe we can answer those in concert. Sure. Well, you know, this is, this is probably my least favorite part of it because it requires process and logic and being really analytical. And fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, my colleague Melissa helps me think it through. So before I go on a trip, I, I try to calculate, you know, how many images I'll be uh, taking, how much data I'll be using, and then I try to plan for it from a, a data storage perspective. And then I try to make sure and we test all the systems so we know that how long, even the time it'll take to download images, to transfer them to SSDs. So I know what to expect at the end of each day uh, to allocate. And you know, sometimes we'll start in the morning. I think the question was asked, how long do you fly for? Um, you know, every day is different. Uh, we start often at, you know, I wake up at 5, 5.30. Uh, double check everything. We might go out at 7.30 or 9 o'clock, depending upon all weather. The weather is, drives everything we do. So, I, you know, we look at the weather, then we have to get to the airport, and then we have to, you know, check in. We may have to uh, fuel up. We have to then, the pilot has to deal with the, you know, the traffic control. We then have to get approvals to go off. So, we might not get out till 10 or 10.30. And then, you know, if it's Iceland, we can land in many places. Uh, and we'll do that. We'll take a break. If the light isn't good, because I really am looking for good light, uh, then we'll just hang out if we can next to a glacier, you know, a waterfall. Uh, we'll, you know, eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or cheese, and then we'll take off again. Uh, and then when I get back, that whole post-production starts, right? I have to transfer everything, double check everything, make sure that I have two copies of everything again. Uh, and then I literally look at that as gold. And I hold on to those hard drives everywhere I go, so I don't leave them behind, don't drop them. I make sure that this uh, adventure and this investment of time, effort, creativity, and passion uh, is always safely stored with me. So it's, it's a pretty arduous process. And then I come home, and it usually takes me three to six months to go through everything. Because when I go through it, I rate them, you know, one star, and then two star, then three star, then four star, then five star. And you know that takes a lot of time because each of them are like my, my babies, my children. Um, but I also have to be very, very disciplined. Uh, is it meeting the artistic standard uh, that I have for myself and also how I want to share and represent Mother Earth with everybody? Very cool, Roger. We're gonna move on to Greenland in a second, but I have a question uh, um, from Richard who's asking, did you have any mentors 
which photographers had the greatest influence on your work and why? You know, there's there's a lot of photographers that I respect on a lot of different levels. Uh, you know, Tom Angleson is somebody who I know and, and respect. Uh, he's really committed his life to making a real difference, especially in the Jackson Hole area. Uh, Paul Nicklin, who I have known quite well for many years. Uh, and so there's, I've had the privilege, and also a gentleman, Nick Grant, who I've known for many years. Each of them are doing their own magnificent work, not only creatively, but also for the planet. They're really trying to make things better for wildlife, all life, and for the environment. You know, for me, I just had a, a very different vision for myself. I wanted to create more abstract contemporary art, and I wanted to do that by engaging with Mother Earth. Uh, so that is... That is where I felt my heart really would live, it does live, and I think it will continue to for a long time. Very cool. We're gonna move into your uh, your Greenland, and, and the question I would ask myself would be, um, you know, we, we typically think of Greenland and, and Iceland being regionally located near each other, but they are vastly different areas, aren't they? Yeah, so, um, when I first went to Iceland uh, with uh, Melissa Shoemaker and we were flying with uh, our helicopter pilot, one of the questions I asked him is, have, have you ever flown to, to Greenland before? And he said, no. I said, well, could we? And he said, well, you know, you have to fly over the Denmark Sea, which is probably four and four and a half hours. He goes, you know, with my auxiliary tank, we could probably do it. So uh, I said, okay, let's think about this. So I came home and I did a uh, helicopter underwater emergency training class, uh, which is a class you take usually with oil rig I workers. I remember that. Right? You know, and the reason oil rig workers take it is if you have a crash, an accident where you're flying to or from the rig, you want to make sure that if you go in the water in a controlled or uncontrolled landing that you can survive. So uh, I took uh, a training class with all these oil rig workers about what happens if there is a crash and, and how do you get out and what happens if you go upside down? So I did that and then I went ahead and uh, we got a survival suit and flew literally from Iceland all the way over the Denmark Sea. It was about a four and a half hour trip uh, to Kulasuk. And one of the reasons I really wanted to get to Greenland was I wanted to photograph icebergs as a portrait looking straight, straight down. And I felt that was one of my dreams is to imagine and capture this 10,000 year old piece of living art in a new and different way. Uh, so we flew over to, to Greenland and then we started to circumnavigate it. And the one thing about Greenland, and it's true for a lot of places I think in the world, it, 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 it goes into your heart, it goes into your DNA and it stays and it grows. So I've, I've done three of these trips now uh, to Greenland and I've essentially circumnavigated the whole country and there's still a lot more to go say. So this is outside so Roger, of an area a couple called questions Con about oh, sure. So we got a couple questions about uh, one of them is when you shoot how does your choice of printing or or, or the substrate that you're going to use influence how you shoot or what you shoot and then uh, along on that is 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 there a size limit on the prints that you uh you make or can produce and 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 do you have a preference um uh on what the print is made on cotton rag or 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 you know aluminum or various things like that so i guess let's talk a little about the output that you can create from these images and 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 how that's handled sure well to the question of you know if, if what am i thinking about when i'm shooting I, I shoot out of love i really do like i emotionally have to be in love with that moment and, and that's how I start to design and capture the textures, the layers, the patterns, the colors, the interplay between, in this photo, for example, you have a glacier, you have melting ice, you have moraine, you have sand. Um, so I shoot what feels the most beautiful, sublime and powerful to me. When I print, I've been primarily printing on Fuji Flex film. Uh, I then have that mounted onto aluminum. And then we put a little bit of plexi on it to give it depth and dimension and also to protect it. Right now, the largest uh, we're printing is about 60 by 80. We can go larger, but truthfully, it's difficult uh, for a lot of the printers to go much larger. 
uh, and also difficult for uh, shipping large pieces. It gets it gets quite uh, heavy. Uh, but that's that's how what I shoot and, and how I think about when I'm printing. What can I bring to life? And Fujiflex so far has been for me uh, the best paper to work with. I put it on aluminum just to someone knows because I, I like the cool contrast it gives. So when you mount it, it provides a little coolness, which I like as it relates to the water and the, like this image here. And then, like I said, the plexi gives it more dimension. So what are we looking at here, Roger? Well, this is insane. This is, you know, one of the things, and my wife knows this, uh, Melissa knows this, my partner, I, I name a lot of my photographs for myself. Uh, and I found, uh, and it's not a secret to anyone, so I want everyone to know that, I have lots of girlfriends and lovers in Greenland, uh, lots of them, because I fall in love with them and, and I think of them as, you know, a relationship I'm having. So what you're looking now is actually a piece of Humboldt Glacier. And we were flying up Humboldt Glacier and there was just this cavernous carving going up. It was hundreds of feet deep. So you're looking at this glacier and you're flying up and you're seeing this water just flowing through it. And it's like, a, it's nonstop. And all of a sudden we came up and we're looking, we see this magical moment where these pieces of ice have literally been pushed from underneath the glacier to on top of the glacier, and that's releasing the water from underneath. Now, there's a lot of scientists that can explain this uh, in terms of how that happened, uh, why that happens. It's one scientist uh, who I've been dealing with, uh, Jason Box, he saw the photo, he said, look, this is a very um, unknown and little studied area, but one that he thinks requires some studying. So you don't see this often. But what you see, and there's a video, part of the video you saw earlier, water is gushing out from underneath this, pushing up on the ice that has come out from underneath the glacier, and then is going all around it, which is what's creating the blue. Uh, I went back to this location again this past year, because I like to see what is changing. And it changed quite dramatically. So again, in the moment, you have to capture the, the photograph, and in the moment, you have to capture that, that beauty, because it will disappear. Uh, and you have to be on it right away. Roger, someone has asked, uh, Alan's asked if you've ever considered making an IMAX uh, film. Uh, I, the answer is I would love to. Uh, I have not reached out to IMAX and they haven't reached out to me, but the answer is I would love to. We have uh, hours upon hours upon hours of footage uh, because I, I drone at least at least twice a day. Uh, so if you multiply, you know, basically 40 minutes to an hour a day times 30 days, you have a lot. Uh, there are some production companies um, that I'm working with, uh, but uh, nothing with IMAX as of this moment. But I, I would that would be a thrill, and I would love to. Very cool. So this is the first image we have that has, uh, uh, other than topography and 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 that, this has. Uh, um, uh, are uh, uh, an animal, a narwhal. Tell us about this and how exciting that is. Can I tell you, if, if I could scream as loud today as I did at that moment, when we saw narwhals, it was mind blowing. First of all, narwhals are truly the unicorn of the sea. They're like, they just rock. They're just amazing mammals. And and they're big, they're really big. So we we had the privilege of seeing them in the open sea like this. There's a lot of ice surrounding them, but they're open in this area. And also, I don't know if you're showing one of the images where they're also surrounded by ice. Uh, but it this was mind blowing. I can tell you, we, we want to be respectful and not disrupt their, their patterns and how they were living. I always want to be very, very respectful of wildlife. So we took our time uh, to circle them. And what we learned was they were completely okay with the helicopter. What would distract them was if there was a shadow of the helicopter coming on the water. So then once we realized that, we had to find a way not to let a shadow go over them or be near them. And then we could get it this moment. And it was spectacular. They were very calm. They're incredibly beautiful. And, um, and even this year, we saw a lot of them again, uh, but I wanted to film them this time. So, 
we were in Peterman Glacier, which is literally the Northwest Greenland. There's nobody within hundreds of miles of us. And I said to my pilot, I want to film them. Uh, I want you to drop me off onto the ice tongue. So it's a glacier on water. Drop me off. Let me go walk 50 meters away. I'll set up the drone and then I'll fly it over the city. I will then walk back to the helicopter, get in the helicopter, and then you and I will fly together and we'll spot the narwhals from the sky while you're flying the helicopter and while I'm flying the drone. So now we have this great uh, magical moments, both photographically and video wise, of narwhals. And at one point, we saw a pot of 24 narwhals, which is one's amazing 24 is like it's like too much sugar too much candy in one day roger if you had to figure how large are they if you had to describe it i think when i was last researching i think they go up to like a ton uh they are they're they're husk themselves can go from six feet to 12 feet so uh i'd have to go back and check the size of them uh, but you have to imagine, like I'm still hundreds of feet in the air, shooting with a 35 to 90, and they still fill up a large portion of the screen. I really want to, again, make them feel like, like they're art, like that you wanted to, to experience them, that they had their own flow and their own zen, and their own emotion. So it's really important for me to try to capture emotion when I'm photographing wildlife and, and, and their own sort of life and their own story. David has a question for us, for you, Roger. It's uh, which came first, the photographic or the artistic impulse, or do they uh, always coincide? Um, that's a great question. That's a really great question. Thanks for asking. For me, it's always artistic. You know, I, I, I'm, I believe in, the, in really releasing our senses, touch, smell, emotions, feelings. So I really feel all of my work and then taking the, the, the photograph, it just flows out of that. So like you're looking at a photograph, which, which I always, when I first saw it, uh, I thought of it as the ethereal ice dance. This is ice, different layers and textures melting up on Peterman Glacier. And again, I fell in love with this. And so to me, it always starts with the creative aspect, the emotional aspect. Uh, and then I design in the sky. And I really do think of it as designing in the sky. And then that's where the picture comes from. Often I, I will take photographs. I don't even realize until afterwards what I've actually captured because I'm so in the flow and in in that state of being absorbed in the moment that I have to go back to really be sure I, I captured what I, I was what I was feeling. So Roger, you, you just mentioned getting lost in the moment. Following along. And um, when uh, when Matthias drops you off so that you can do some of your drone co like footage collection there, like are you aware that you're as alone as anybody can be on the planet? Like, what's that like? <laughs> uh, no, it's it's a it's a really great question, Nick. You know, sometimes I'm just literally just scared, like like what's going to happen underneath me? Because you you hear ice, you know, it creaks, it cracks, it moves. There's water, you know, you can't slip and you don't want to fall down you know anything uh, so sometimes it's a little terrifying to be honest uh sometimes it's the most peaceful zen moment of all time because when you let your brain just relax and, and you're in that flow of you realize i can see my i can see a map of the world in my mind i can see greenland and then i know where i am and i realize how small small and insignificant i am but it also makes me realize how connected I am to the universe and the planet and how we're all part of the same, you know, the same cycle of life and, tr and transformation. And then I get tremendous joy. And sometimes uh, there is that state of flow where I'm so absorbed. Uh, I, I lose track of where I am and which can be really beautiful. But if you're in a place which is not so safe, you, you have to make sure you maintain some level of consciousness. Roger, we've got a question. It says it, everything looks so surreal. Um, what are typically the camera settings you use to capture, I guess, like in this image, the, the, the for better, lack of a better term, the flow uh, or the motion, to capture the motion in the still image? 
You know, it, that's a great question. Thank you. The, the settings often depend upon, again, the weather conditions. Now, uh, is it very cloudy, not cloudy, my altitude? Um, is it sunny or not? But I tend to be around, around five, six. I tend to shoot about a thousandth of a second uh, or higher, depending upon like icebergs, I tend to go higher because light will be bouncing off and also increase my, uh, my f-stop. Uh, but it tends to be around five, six, up to eight. If it's really, really bright again, it might go higher. But I, I try to focus on a fast shutter speed because I really want crisp, clean images. Like this one? Yeah. Uh, uh, look, so what I love is the story of the image, not my story, but the story of what you're looking at, and, you know, and the questions and the mystery. So now you're looking at the ice sheet, right? We're again in Northwest Greenland. Uh, each photo you know, brings back you know, a, a lovely moment in my, in my heart. And so we're flying over this melt and you, you start to wonder like one, what is the ice doing on top of the water? How did the ice get onto the ice sheet? But if you follow that blue line all the way down, if you really zoom in, it's a moulin. And for people who don't know what a moulin is, it's, it's when the ice water when the ice sheet melts and the water starts to go down the ice sheet, it carves, right? And water always finds the weakest link. And once it finds a weak spot in the ice sheet, it starts to carve and carve and then suddenly just disappears. So I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of photographing and filming moulins. And you just wonder like, what's happening? How far is it? How many thousands of feet is this water draining? Is it not draining? Uh, and then I've worked with some amazing uh, glaciologists. One is a, uh, Kristen Ponar, University of Buffalo, who studies and is an expert in moulins. So I'll share photos and video with her about this. But that is part of the story of, of Greenland, which is all this transformation is happening both at the ice sheet level, right, and also below the surface. And I love the calm of this, the harmony, sort of the color balance. Uh, and also it invites you to wonder more, like, what's, what's going on? Where's that water going? So Roger, one more, another question is, is and, and maybe I should hold this for the end, but I'll ask now, is um, Richard is saying, what would you like your, um, or oh, the legacy of your work to be? <laughs> That's a great question. That's a really, really big question. I, I, you know, I would like the legacy of my work to be that our, that we've been given this tremendous gift of life. And that gift of life is given to us by Mother Earth and the biosphere, right? And I, I hope the legacy is that people realize that we've been given something and that we have the responsibility uh, to protect it, preserve it, and live in harmony with it. And that to me is the whole notion is, is living in harmony with nature, not trying to dominate it, but trying to honor it, celebrate it, have gratitude for it, and take it in our heart and realize uh, without it, a healthy environment, uh, there is no life, there is no hu human species. So I think that would be my legacy for people to realize that we are one and that we need to live in harmony and peace with nature as well as with each other. Along those lines, Roger, a follow-up from David is, what is uh, what's the next risk you would like to take? Oh, uh, you know, I, I, it's not a risk. I mean, my whole and, and be careful, because I think, because I, because I think that uh, I think I saw your wife register for this uh, webinar, so she may be watching. Uh, she, <laughs> yes, you know, I, I have some. I always have crazy ideas, as you, Steve, and Nick now, and and everyone who I collaborate with uh, knows. Uh, there's there's a few that I'm I'm looking at. I'm I'm not quite ready to go public because they're a little bit nuts. Um, so I, I, if we can come back and do another one of these, or I can answer that gentleman's question later on, I'll be glad to. But there's, I always feel like the way to stay alive is to engage yourself and get uncomfortable. And I think to me, life is about being comfortable with the uncomfortable because that's where you're challenging yourself, you're testing yourself, you're growing, you're learning, and you're making lots and lots of mistakes along the way. And I make a lot of them. I take a lot of lousy, lousy photos. Uh, and take a lot of lousy, lousy video. Um, but that's, to me, is that's where my discomfort with that 
but getting used to that allows me to push through it and embrace the unknown, the uncertain, the uncomfortable. And that's where my creativity comes from is being frankly enjoying that. This day, not so much. This, the photo you're looking at now, this was a moody, bad day. Um, we hit tremendous turbulence. Now my door is always off and we had a lot of turbulence. We flew that day, I think for almost eight to 10 hours. We had to obviously refuel along the way. Uh, we were over open water with no survival suit on, not great. It was raining, again, not great. And you know, when you bounce around like a ping pong ball uh, in the sky, it can get unnerving. And th this was one of those moments, but, and I'm not cavalier at all about any of this. And I do try to you know, mitigate risk. I think when you see a, a moment like this, you realize you have to be comfortable with taking risks. You have to be comfortable with the unknown. And then you get to have a story like this to share with everyone. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> a, so, that's an amazing photo, Roger. And look, and, and there's a- there's Is a that a receding glacier in the back there? Exactly, I was gonna say, this is a, a multi-billion year old story being told. All of that was covered with glacier, right? All of that covered with ice sheet. And what you're seeing is the revelation, the revealing of the mountains, right? And what that's telling you is that climates naturally change. They also are, are accelerated by, I believe, our behavior. But you're seeing the glacier sort of retreats, sort of it's starting to end its life, it's a pathway. And you're seeing what it also picked off in the nearby is, is this iceberg. So you're seeing this story, the cycle of life and creation and revelation and changes and transformation and climate change and science. There's so much there, but I want to capture in a very simple, almost poetic way where you feel you feel your own feelings and your own emotions and you read your own story into it. Great. Question was uh, posed by Dennis. He's asking uh, volcanoes, question mark, and then also um, your wife says she is watching. And <laughs> she's watching and I will get critiqued afterwards. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but what was the question about volcanoes? I'm not sure I understood. Are, are, it was just volcanoes question mark. So are there volcanoes, are there uh, uh, you know, um, uh, dormant volcanoes? What, what is the, the topography, I guess, is my question, is the question. Topography of Greenland? Topography I, I, of Greenland. I'm not sure, it just says volcanoes question mark. Okay, well, I'll, let me just say Greenland is, so diverse. So this image um, is was an hour and a half, two hours up onto the ice sheet uh, outside of uh, Nook, Greenland. So it's about an hour and a half away. We we'd flown over because we were going uh, to the uh, Isua Greenstone Belt, which is uh, being studied by a lot of people, but being studied by a lead astrophysicist named Ben Weiss uh, at MIT. And I met Ben in Greenland. And actually, I met him at uh, in Nook and at the camp. And you know, he's studying about when did Greenland and when did planet Earth collect, uh, connect electromagnetically to the universe. So I went to visit them, and then I said, "See, yes, let's just fly out a little further." We've kept flying another hour, and that day, this was the only image I took of the ice sheet, and it was a beautiful fractal moment, right, where, it's, where nature's repeating itself. So Greenland has fractals. It has just the most magnificent uh, landscapes, uh, which I, this past year, the landscapes I saw were breathtaking. So Greenland is just so diverse. It has a lot of everything. And that's what I love about it. And the more that I wander, the more that magic happens like this. So looking at this image and the, and the tonal quality and the tonal range of the various hues of blue, um, Going back to a question from Dennis, he says, do you process your images for a faithful reproduction of color or do you manipulate the color and contrast and saturation to yield uh, a level of drama? And, and our next image will, will take us even further on that. But I know that we work real hard, uh, Hasselblad does, is, is representing color very accurately. So I'm assuming um, that out of camera, it's pretty close to what your eye saw on site. That, that's correct. You know the, the one belief I have is 
I have to get it in the camera. And so I don't crop photos. Uh, I refine them if I need to afterwards, but I have to capture it in the camera. And that is one of the reasons that I, I do love the Hasselblad because it gives me all the tonal components, all the contrast, the color that I love. Now this photograph is literally what it is. It's a iceberg. It feels like it's in the galaxy, the Star Trek galaxy of the universe, but it was just yeah. floating like yeah. that. And so I wanted to shoot at a specific angle so it felt like it was a starship. You know, I wanted to feel like it could take off. Uh, and at the same time, make, created a mystery of like, what am I looking at? What is, where am I? What am I seeing? How does it do that? I, I want people, the more that you, you wonder, the more that you engage with, with the image, the more that you start to also realize the magnificent, magnificence of our planet. Uh, and that's where I think it can touch us and ask us, Okay, now what can I do to make sure that other generations, seven generations from now, will be able to see what I can see? Yeah. This is another breathtaking image. Yeah, no, this this was this is outside of southeast Greenland, outside of Kulasuk. And we were on our way to Helheim Glacier. And we, you know, you there are admittedly hundreds and hundreds of pieces and thousands of pieces of ice everywhere, right? So you're you're trying to find the ones that touch you the most, the ones that you've never seen before or felt before. And, and this was one of those. I felt like, you know, I, my interpretation would be different than other people's, but I really felt like I was connecting with my own heart when I saw this. It's interesting you mentioned that because our next image here almost looks like veins or arteries uh it, it's an amazing shot so th this is the ice sheet of greenland and what's happening is as temperatures get warmer and warmer um, the ice sheet melts and what it's doing now is it's revealing previous layers of ice and so again one scientist said to me that she thought this might be from the last ice age which is what twenty thousand years ago which is why it's so dark so you have this beautiful water, the green, the aqua coming alive, and then you have this darkness. And that may have been from a volcanic eruption that happened you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago that was sealed. Uh, a lot of this is to be discovered and a lot of this is to be studied. And then you see different seams, like the white seam, sort of where the ice sheet and the glacier starts to almost pull apart. So it's, it's a very dynamic environment. And I, I love these that have a symmetry, but also have a sense of like almost emotional chaos. Uh, they, you, know, you want to literally swim and paddle through them, but you also want to understand, well, what is it? And what did it tell us if it is from the last Ice Age? Uh, so yeah, I have, I have a large collection of these from this past year that I'm looking forward to sharing as well. Jumping back a couple images to the iceberg and the stark black background, uh, Dennis is asking, how could the sea look so black? Uh, so that's another great question. I, I shoot at a very high shutter speed for two reasons. One, because there's a lot of bounce of light off an iceberg, right? And what I found, uh, contrary to other things I will photograph, a lot of times having bright light is really good because it gives you depth into the water. But when I shoot a very fast shutter speed, then I minimize the bounce, and I am using a polarizer filter on it. But what it also does is it takes the water and darkens it down as well. So it serves multiple purposes uh, when I'm doing my photography. I like this keyhole image. Yeah, me too, actually. <laughs> uh, look, I'm always looking, I'm always searching. I'm always trying to design, compose, what hasn't been felt or seen before, right? And do it in a way that is, like I said, fine art, contemporary art. And we were, this is a very windy day. We we're hitting on a 40 or 50 knots of wind. And it was difficult for my pilot to sort of keep the helicopter where I wanted to get the shot. So we constantly kept bouncing around and shaking. Uh, and but this was, what I was trying to get, there's a lot of layers. You're looking deep, deep down to, uh, into both ice and water. And truly, and what you're seeing on the side is some cryokinites, those, those holes. 
that contain water, but it also is absorbing ash and dirt from the sky that then burrows into the ice sheet. And then as it absorbs more heat, facilitates more melt. So that gave me a little more texture, but it feels like this is either rising up or sinking in, depending upon what your perspective is. But it was, it's clearly uh, a one of a kind. This next photo, Roger, I know that we discussed keeping it in the slide presentation, not keeping it in there. I like it because a lot of the imagery we're looking at today, it's very difficult to get any sense of scale. Right. And I like this image because we have the ship in the front and the buildings, and it gives us a sense of the enormity of the area you're in and the expanse of the area you're in. Right, so this, this village uh, is in southeast uh, Greenland. It's north of Kulasuk, and we we're flying through a fjord, and uh, all of a sudden we saw this little, little village. And as we flew over it at a right level, because you don't want to disturb the people, we didn't see anybody. There's no one there. But believe it or not, they have a helipad. So I said to my pilot, could we please land there? Uh, so he's like, yeah, I don't know where anybody is. So yeah, there's a helipad we can land. So we landed, and then all of a sudden, like 60, 70 children came racing out, racing out. It was fantastic. They wanted to touch the helicopter. They wanted to look at the cameras. Uh, and then I took out the drone, and I flew in a drone this whole area. But the kids were just magnificent. And everywhere in the world where you go, uh, especially when you go into ultra-remote places, uh, I'm as fascinated by their lives and their history and their culture and how they all live. And they're fascinated by people who come to visit them. So this specific village I'm going to be going back to in uh, April 2022, we're doing a dog sled trip from Kulsik up to here. And that will take us about a week just to get up and then a week to get back. Uh, an amazing village, an amazing village. And the kids were just, like I said, beyond wonderful. Very cool. They probably don't get visitors dropping in very often. <laughs> no, there's not many people doing that now. Roger, we have a question from Wayne. He's asking that uh, your composition and the colors all through the camera. So he's asking how you achieve such consistently pristine colors without a UV color shift. And, and I'll let you answer that, but I'm also gonna mention the Hasselblad Natural Color Solution. We work really, really hard as a company uh, with our cameras to produce the most natural, realistic color that we can. But go ahead, Roger, I'll let you answer the question. Oh, uh, the answer is nature is that beautiful, and I fortunately have a great, a great camera uh, and a great pilot, and I know how to push the button at the right time. And if I don't push it at the right time, I'll push it again another time. Um, look, this this if you <laughs> went to Greenland, and I, I know this exact moment because we did a video called I think it was called My Girlfriend or My Lover, um, and there's a great story about what's happening behind it and why this pattern exists. Because actually, there's a big mountain right behind it where the snow and the ice is blown, and the mountain blocks it, and then it goes around and it creates this pattern. And then there's a melt in the middle. And this was, like I said, my first girlfriend in Greenland that I completely fell in love with. In fact, we ended up landing the helicopter, climbing up the mountain, and eating lunch overlooking her. And then that's where I droned it. Um, I just say, look, this is this is nature. Do I fine tune things? Of course, I fine tune things, but it has to happen in the camera. You you can't create those little wave patterns uh, with the clarity and the detail unless it happens in the camera. This is another example of that. You know, we're flying over a semi-open water in northwest, uh, north central Greenland, and you know, I'm looking for again patterns and designs. In this case, I will say my truth. I saw a polar bear. That's exactly what I saw, and that's what I wanted to photograph, a frozen polar bear. Oh, yeah. It was probably 300 feet long, 30 yards long, you know, another 75 yards wide. I see and him now. I'm sorry, Steve? I said that's what I see now that you mentioned it. Yeah, oh. I see the polar bear there. So it's and it, it was interesting. I've seen polar bears in lots of places except for Greenland, except for this one in ice. So I consider this my first official polar bear sighting in Greenland. Uh, Paul, uh, J. Paul Moore says the previous image looks like the eye of an albino whale. And then um, 
question about the the helicopter you fly in. He uh, someone that is asking is uh, what model chopper do you use? And his comment is it must be a very rugged construction. Correct. Uh, the one we primarily use is an R66, a Robinson 66. Uh, we're in the Arctic. Uh, we were using a different helicopter when I was just in Namibia uh, back in February, March. But we try to go with the R66. It it's fast. It's really quite stable. Uh, gives us some room for an auxiliary tank. Uh, and it so far has been just a wonderful helicopter to work with. But I want to be clear, I've got an amazing pilot. And we have now have our own rhythm, our own language, which usually does not include yelling at each other because he's really nice and quiet. Uh, but we, we do have a language that allows us to put me in the best place for the moment. Roger, question is, uh, do many people speak English in Greenland? Uh, yes. Now, the Greenlandic people, first of all, are truly as kind, wonderful, smart, fascinating, interesting people as I've ever met anywhere on the planet. I mean, you just think of their history and, and how they've uh, transformed their lives and how they live today. Remarkable people. And I've actually now developed some really nice friendships with the folks I've met over there uh, everywhere. Uh, they're great. Uh, so, yes, they do speak English. They do speak you know, Greenlandic. They, there's also you're going to find like some of the smartest people because they deal with so much an international world that they can uh, embrace different cultures and, and ways of living and integrate into who and how they are. Uh, this photograph I just want to talk about was in northern Greenland. What you're seeing on the left is a glacier coming down a mountain range, and then you're seeing the the more the the golden tones. Those are part of the mountain that have now been exposed. Those are actually raised up. And then the green is actually the water. It's melted and has a frozen layer on it. And the big pieces of ice in it have broken off from the glacier and have settled in that water reserve. So it's incredibly, again, I think it's graphic, it's abstract, it's designed, but there's history and there's stories built into all this from a geology perspective, a creative perspective, and also how people will feel about it. What does it mean to them? No, I'm going to be doing a series called Naked and Invisible. And, and the reason I'm calling it Naked and Invisible, because one, it's a state of the world that right now we're, we are quite naked to this invisible virus. But when you look at Greenland, you also see mountains that have become naked, right? Uh, and what's invisible and has disappeared are the glaciers in many, many places. So this one has this notion of this glacier that was this whole area was covered, right? And now they're retreating both to the center right and also to the top left. And so I'm always looking for a, a, a balance, a centering part of all my images, something that brings me in, then has a harmony and balance top to bottom, left to right, and then allows me then to explore more. But at first I have to have a centering part, and that's what this glacier does. And then within it, you can see where it was and what it's retreating to and what it's carved and what it's done to the landscape. But again, I want people to respond to it, hopefully, on a very visceral level, uh, and then say, okay, I feel this, I imagine this, and now what is it, and what does it mean, and why did that happen? Because that's where we come into play. Like, why did it happen, and what can we be doing, perhaps differently, for the future, in our own lives and collectively? This looks like a convergence of... Uh... Uh, I don't know, an ice sheet and, I don't know, and, What's that? And debris, I don't know. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. And I'm going to hold on one second, Steve. Hey, Melissa, could you tell them to stop? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, we have a little noise. We're just going to um, eliminate that so we can keep going. This one actually is from the ice sheet, again, of Greenland. And what you're looking at is multiple layers and levels and textures. So the blue is melted water, okay? What you're seeing underneath it is the actual glacier itself. And what's happened is that the ice has broken off into this different patterns. I'm sorry, just so everyone knows, there's a special visitor who's just joined me. I just want everyone to know, that's Gemma. Gemma, do you want to say hi? 
Okay. Okay. But there she goes. So that was her role for today. <laughs> so again, what I mentioned before is I'm looking for a centering aspect of an image, right? So you go to the middle. There's harmony on both sides, but there's completely different textures and layers and patterns. So on the right, you're looking at chopped up ice uh, and, and some like almost snow, fresh snow covered. And on the left, you're just looking at really water on top of glacier. So that's really what you're saying. And that's probably that visual is likely a couple hundred meters uh, by a little more than a couple hundred meters. Roger, uh, Dennis is asking if you have any, if you have made any books. Uh, no, my intention is to do that, uh, but the answer is not yet, uh, but I hope so. Thank you for the question. Uh, I like the seashells I see in this one. That's fantastic. Nick, what do you see, Nick? That's what I see. Um, ripples, right? Like um, motion, the, uh, you know, after after something's been scattered, right? So uh, I, I'm the cook at home. So this uh, this to me looks a bit like, you know, when you've when you thrown some spices in the pot. <laughs> I, I get it. Hey, Steve, has anybody written in what they think this might be? Uh, haven't yet, but uh, feel free, uh, those that are watching, to uh, to comment on what you see in uh, this image. Yeah, look, I, I love the energy of this. Again, there's that balance that you're brought in with that motion, and then there's those lines that bring you in, and then there's that nice soft blue, which, a rich blue, which is the water. Uh, and this, again, is they're all rare moments. Greenland by itself is rare, but finding this was a, really a one-of-a-kind experience. So we've got uh, stress, fra stress fractures in the ice and the ice shelf from a couple different individuals. So, yep. uh, you know, it's uh, right. the beauty of these images is, 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 is that everyone can interpret them the way they see them. And that's the uniqueness of the imagery you create in these venues, Roger. I would, and I would encourage people on the abstract images, if you, get, if you can, turn them 90 degrees, turn them 90 degrees, turn them 90 degrees they become different, you feel differently, experience differently. And, and actually, it's quite fun. And I encourage people to, to do that because it allows you to look at it as if you're in the helicopter from different perspectives. So this image is a piece, a big piece of a ultra huge iceberg. Uh, and I just love, there's a, there's a peacefulness to it and there's a lot of mystery to it. You know, what does the rest of the iceberg look like? What, why is this piece, the small piece, low to the ground? Uh, what's underneath it? How big is it? But there's a, there's a simplicity and a beauty to it. And again, something that centers you and that there's a harmony on each side. So I, I, I want, there's a lot of my images that will hopefully excite people's senses. Some of them I want to bring peace and tranquility to your soul. Uh, so I'm, each, each moment I feel what I want to share. And this one was to me is about more about tranquility and just pure love. I think this one reminds me of- uh, I see an in. eggplant. Oh. <laughs> uh, deep water fish. Go right? ahead, Nick. So when, yeah, so uh, that, that last image reminded me of, um, you know, when there's a, um, a, a, you know, deep sea in the, in the total darkness and, uh, you know, the, uh, they're using lights to eliminate what's nearby. Uh, you know, as I did what you asked, Roger, rotated that one 90 degrees, I saw a fish, <laughs> you know, floating in the absolute uh, dark of the deep ocean, which is really, you know, it's really cool. Okay, you're now at one of the most. We got uh, a all... comment. Go ahead. I was going to say, so we had a couple of comments. Uh, um, one person said, my wife sees peacock feathers. Another said, Van Gogh, starry, starry ice. One said, uh, ballerinas from the nutcracker in the original fantasia um so you know everyone can interpret these images the way they see them which is so cool and i love all of those interpretations that's wonderful thank you everybody for writing in on that now this is the national park of greenland it was a long day we were flying over this mountain range and you know again you you never know what you're going to see you have to wander you have to be open-hearted and you know you have to make sure your harness and seatbelt are still on um and we flew into this mountain range and we saw the most spectacular 
most spectacular jewels of the mother earth. I, I really believe like, the more that I wander, I feel like mother earth is saying, you know what, today, I'm gonna give you another gift. I'm gonna reveal more of my beauty to you because you're taking the time to come visit me. And that's what it feels like, like every day she gives me more and more gifts. And this area, and I did a whole video on this and, and, and took a lot of images here, just so moving. And my pilot, I said to him, could you please drop me off down here? Which he did. And then he flew away and I just stood there. And I just flew my DJI, you know, drone with the Hasselblad lens on, I just flew it. And I'm just standing there and I'm looking around and I'm looking at what I'm seeing and trying to tell a visual story. And honestly, I, I, it brings tears to your eyes and makes your heart just cry for the sheer beauty and to think that this is all ours. This is all ours. And all we have to do is honor, celebrate, and protect it. It's all we have to do. And we get more and more of these gifts. So this series is, is one that is so dramatically different. Uh, and I love all those interpretations of what everybody has said. Those are, those are great. So Roger, a question from Richard is, given that you don't crop, do you end up taking a lot of images of the same subject? Um, and then uh, I'll tail that with this is, uh, Jenny is asking if you need a lackey. Uh, I'll work for free, speak German and Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. You know, it's a great question about, uh, because I don't crop, how many shots do I take? It really depends upon, again, it really weather conditions. Truthfully, how much fuel do we have? Uh, how important do I think that moment is? Uh, there are some times where I will circle, uh, you know, we can get two circles in before we have to pull out and do it again, or hard banks. Uh, so it really depends upon if that moment is worth it, I will make sure that I get it before I move on. And then there's some things that after a while I realize I know the rhythm of what I want to shoot and how I want to shoot it, and I can get it, you know, the, the first time. Great question, though. What do we have here, Roger? Another ice, another glacier retreating? Uh, well, actually, you have more than that. You know, I, just, I was talking to a scientist, uh, Lincoln Pitcher, over at UCLA this morning, and uh, we're putting together all these House of Blood photos, all these images, and we're putting scientists next to them because we want to start sharing art with science so people can understand like what's really happening. And what you're really seeing is, again, glacier, glacial you know, sort of retreat. And you're seeing the, the exposure of these mountains that have been there you know, for millions and billions of years. And so you're seeing this whole history taking place. And then what you start to see is you start to see a lot of uh, the mountains ground down over time by glaciers. And there's a lot of sand in Greenland too. So Greenland right now is looking at trying to export sand as a business. So there's people studying, you know, what glaciers are, you know, grinding up the, these mountains so much and where are the biggest sand deposits, what type of sand can is it and what can it be used for, construction, glass blowing, whatever. So what you're seeing here is, I think, an exquisite landscape, right? Uh, with, you know, clouds and colors and lighting. You're also seeing billions of years in the making. And you're seeing what the history may look like for Greenland from a commerce perspective, partially. So th there's a lot happening here, but there's a simplicity to it as well, right? You come into the middle, there's harmony and balance on both sides, and then you can sort of fly into this photograph and study the different details. So that, that what you're looking at is, yeah, it's a landscape, that's all. Yeah, this is it almost looks like you're uh, in a cave looking out. Yeah, I wonder what some of what some of the the people who are still here with us what they think it is. Uh, this is an iceberg off the coast of Alulasat. They're probably about an hour away, and my intention was just to photograph icebergs, and we saw this one and the amazing level of detail and the balance between what's above the water with those edges and what's below the water goes, you know, diving into the water, into the abyss. I just thought it was so magical and mysterious and so evocative uh, of, of the wonderment of life and also the creation of an iceberg and the transformation of one. Uh, so this is that, that 
moment. You know, the, the lines, the composition, the pattern, um, they just happen to be perfect. Ellie says it's the gaze of the ice dragon. Awesome. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So imagine it's 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning. Literally, you've been up all day since 5 o'clock. You're going over Humboldt Glacier, which is north west Greenland. Uh, you're heading to an abandoned mining camp to sleep. And your pilot. I know we're really tired, but I have to photograph this one. So this, this is this is light, light at one one thirty in the morning in Greenland, and you just see these beautiful carvings going through the ice sheet, and then these beautiful like white you know, teardrops uh, just sort of floating there, waiting. Um, and I just thought it was so sort of again centered, but also very very gentle. And what you realize with this gentleness is this tremendous transformation of the glacier shifting and moving and, you know, energy happening and things splitting apart and pulling together and recomposing itself. And all that's happening, and yet it creates this sort of gentleness. And I love when nature, which is the, the almighty power, creates gentleness for us uh, with all of her energy and all of her strength. Roger, we've got a comment from Fred who says, uh, your photos remind me of Ansel Adams depicting the incredible beauty of nature. They also remind me of Edward Weston who turned ordinary objects into sensual expressions of deep emotion. I think that uh, it's pretty good to be mentioned in the company of those two photographers. I would like to say thank you very much for, for sharing those exceptionally uh, kind words. I really do appreciate that. That means that does mean a lot to me. Uh, I, I do want to bring Mother Earth to life. Like this photograph was about 10 minutes away from the last photograph. This was taken, this was literally the one I was talking about earlier. It's like 1 32 o'clock in the morning. And I said to my pilot, I have to photograph it now. He's like, please. I'm like, no, it may not be here tomorrow. The weather may change. And so we photographed it and I said, okay, I need you to go higher because you know, I, I was open at 35 millimeters here, Steve and Nick, okay? I'm like higher, higher, and I wanted to get all of it in, right? So he's climbing, he goes higher, I'm like higher. So finally, we got to 8,600 feet, 8,600 feet to get this image. And what you see is these multiple layers. In fact, I'm working with uh, University of Buffalo scientists about trying to understand how do these sort of fractal layers uh, descend, and then all of a sudden that bright blue starts to go into another little area and then descends into a moulin. So that's at 8,600 feet between 1.30 and 2 o'clock in the morning in Humboldt Glacier. Uh, I, I, I came back the next day. We got some great images as well, but I also droned it. It's, again, each of them are unique and each of them are a surprise to the heart, to the mind, and it's a gift that we're given. And so that's why I love to share so much because I, I want people to feel the gift that will be given. So Roger, we've got a question about how cold is it when you're flying? Uh, so what's the, what's typically the air temperature when you're flying at 8,600 feet or even lower in Greenland? What, uh, and what is the surface temperature too when you're when you're on the uh, on the ice sheet? Well, uh, let me. It's a, it's a multiple part question. Let me try to be as precise and concise as I can. Um, you know, one of the projects I did this past year was uh, determining historical temperature norms of Greenland for July. And then when I went to those locations, uh, I would then document the new temperature in this year. So I would get out of the helicopter, I would take out a whiteboard, literally a school whiteboard with a dry erase mark. I write down the date, the GPS coordinates, the historical temperature norm, and the, and the new temperature. Uh, temperatures are up at least 25% over historical norms uh, where I went. And it may be even higher. In fact, I was in the most Northern part of Greenland a year and a half ago, and it should have been 44 degrees and it was 72 degrees. And that day uh, when we landed, I, I put on shorts, um, which is not, not good news. 
Uh, when you go to 8,600 feet at 1.30 in the morning, it's really, 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 really cold. Uh, I don't shoot with, I have no gloves on when I travel uh, because I need to feel the camera and know when I'm, I'm taking the picture. Uh, when it gets to that cold, you know, we've gotten to, in Celsius, we've gotten as low as minus six, minus eight Celsius, and we've been as high as, up to Fahrenheit, up to 73. So it's a range depending upon where you go, what the wind patterns are and the weather patterns are coming in uh, from the west to the north. So it changes. So you have to, you know, layer up and be prepared uh, for any situation you could face. All right, cool. Roger, we're going to take a look at your uh, your glorious Greenland video, if, if you don't mind, right now. So I'm going to go ahead and cue that up, and we'll we'll let some people see some uh, additional motion uh, from Greenland that you've created. Roger, some uh, incredibly moving imagery in that uh, last video. Um, definitely have had an incredible uh, uh, time with you today, and we do have some questions. So let's see if we can answer some of those and, and uh, before we uh, before we uh, say goodbye for the day. So um, uh, how can I just add one thing? Yeah, yeah. One thing. So I just want everyone to know too, all the video work we do, we also work with nonprofits, meaning myself, you know, Melissa. So we just uh, did a video with a lady, an incredibly talented uh, woman, Melody Federer, and an exceptionally talented gentleman named Bert Bacharach, uh, who people may know. And the song is called The Sun Also Rises. So we collaborated on that and we did it uh, with uh, Conservation International. And that video was released just last week and it was also used to not raise awareness, but to raise money for Conservation International. And we've done videos also with uh, Portugal the Man, uh, uh, Herbie Hancock, uh, Health, uh, Elie Zaveda, Agnes Obel, and we'll be doing more because the notion is we want to bring nature to people in a more dynamic way so people can get more involved. And I would always recommend getting involved with Conservation International, the NRDC, Woods Hole uh, in Massachusetts. These are people and organizations that make a real difference. So I just wanted to share that with you. So Roger, we have a question. One person said, uh, you know, urge folks to go to your website. So Roger, what is your website? Uh, it's Pretty a simple. very complicated, very complicated. It took me ages to think about it. It's called rogerfishman.com. <laughs> uh, my Instagram is equally complicated. It's just at Roger Fishman. 
Um, so yeah, it's pretty straightforward, and we're we're always bringing out new work and more work from on art from Mother Nature. Uh, also, if you go to the Hasselblad website, we did a uh, a piece about a year ago uh, with Roger. You can look at that on the Hasselblad website as well. And then we have a question uh, relating to the website. It's it's someone's asking if you could just comment quickly about the Mirror Project. Oh, the Mirror Project. So for people who haven't seen it, you know, I, I had an idea and. My wife will tell you that it was a crazy idea. Uh, and the whole premise was most of my work is about, really, it's about each of us. It's about the environment. It's really about us. And it's about becoming your truest self and your best self. And I always thought, well, if what would happen if animals could see themselves for the very first time? I mean, yeah, they can see a reflection in water, but could see themselves in a mirror. Because you know, mirrors are always about being only surface deep, right? You only see what's at that level. But if you can go beyond the surface, what would you see? What would you feel? And as a human being, if you could go beyond the surface of yourself and see your life, would this be the life you want to lead? And if it's not, what might you change? So I wanted to use the um, mirror as a, a sort of a, a symbol uh, and allow wildlife to see themselves. Uh, so I literally had mirrors made uh, and then shipped around the world. I took somebody to Antarctica and photographed uh, emperor penguins looking at themselves. Uh, and it's very abstract again, because sometimes you don't even see the mirror, you just see the penguin, or sometimes you see both. And then I went to Africa and did it with giraffes and lions and cheetah, um, and I went to Borneo to do it. But the whole premise was as, as they see themselves for the first time, each day we get a chance to see ourselves again for the very first time and decide, is this the life we want to live? And if it is, fantastic. And is it a life we maybe want to refine or change? Then the answer is take that risk and go for it. Because not going for it is not allowing yourself to be your best self. Um, so the Mirror Project was all over the world. I had a great guide in Africa. We went, we broke a lot of mirrors by accident. Uh, we had elephants looking at themselves, a whole uh, herd of elephants, like literally 30 feet behind me walking by as I'm photographing them in a mirror which was a little intense, uh, but it's, again, it's sure. to make each of us feel connected to ourselves, to the planet, and to the lives we're living. Well, cool. Roger, thanks so much for sharing your passion with us today. Um, thank you, Nick, for uh, Robert's uh, helping to host this. We definitely had uh, uh, a great time looking at uh, some of your imagery. I wish we had time to look at more of it. Um, again, go to Roger's website, rogerfishman.com, to take a look at that as well. Um, reach out to Roger on Instagram if you have specific questions. But again, thanks for joining us uh, today. Thanks for joining Hasselblad and Roberts and Roger today. Uh, there will be a survey after uh, the webinar you'll get from us. Please fill it out and give us your insight as to what you like, what you didn't like, what you wanted to see in the future. Um, we really enjoy these artist series. And, and Roger, again, thank you so much for sharing your time with us as well as uh, your, 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 your imagery. Uh, uh, Nick, thanks to you for helping put this together. Guys, thanks Thank so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And uh, we Happy wish holidays. everyone a, a good holiday season as well. So thanks, Roger. Thanks, Nick. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Bye. Roger.